I'm Marie-Monique Stackel, and I'm the president of the French Institute Alliance Française, and I'm delighted to welcome you tonight. It is our second talk of the third year, second of the third, and the art of sex and seduction. And tonight we're going to talk about jealousy. I must tell you that the dominatrix two weeks ago uh, got much more people than jealousy. <laughs> there was a line around the block. Um, and today I asked my assistant, why don't you come tonight? She says, I'm not jealous. I said, everybody is jealous. Don't tell me that. But anyway, so you're here and we're going to have a very exciting evening about jealousy. And it will be moderated by a wonderful uh, friend of FIAF, who is our curator, and she's a writer and editor, Erika Lumière. And she has been associated with very, very tightly with these series. And uh, we're already talking about next year and what we can do, which can be as exciting as this year. But she was a senior editor at Marie Claire, has worked for Family Circle, and she is the one who is behind uh, all these talks this year and hopefully next year as well. Following the discussion, the panelists will sign some of their books uh, upstairs. And finally, uh, in a more amusing topic, next week on October 28, we have a talk about passion and bringing the spark back into your relationship. Have more fun with each other, isn't it? So thank you for joining us tonight, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Merci, Marie-Monique. I'm thrilled to welcome you all to the Art of Sex and Seduction. This is my third year producing this program, and I feel incredibly humbled that we've had such great interest from you all, as well as the likes of the Paris Review and the New York Times. I think the columnist Ralph Gardner Jr. described the series best in last week's Wall Street Journal after he came to FIAF to hear Catherine Robbe-Grier, France's most famous dominatrix. He wrote that he always thought the Alliance Française was where you went to take French lessons. And boy, did he get a French lesson that night from Madame. I think we all did. Well, listen up and take out your pens and paper because class is in session again. Tonight's topic, la jalousie, the truth about love, mistrust, and suspicious minds. Why take on jealousy? Jealousy is often said to be the most dangerous passion, the most ugly and selfish of emotions. It has the power to stir up a whirlwind of fear, insecurity, obsession, torment, and rage. Jealousy is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on, Iago warns Shakespeare's Othello. And yet, many experts argue that jealousy is as necessary as love and sex. It is what makes us human and has ensured our very survival as a species. Some experts will even go so far as to say that jealousy plays a central role in our everyday lives. So how can we overcome the jealousy trap? This awful, sinister feeling that too often gets under our skin, muddles the mind, and breaks hearts. And above all, what can we do to channel jealousy into happier and healthier relationships? Let's hear what our panelists have to say about all this as we put la jalousie under the microscope. I'm very excited to introduce some of the leading voices on the topic today who can hopefully enlighten us with their perspectives on love, mistrust, and suspicious minds. First up, it is my great privilege to welcome to FIAF a very special guest, the notorious Neil Strauss. Neil Strauss is an award-winning writer for Rolling Stone and a former columnist at the New York Times. Strauss became famous to millions as the author of The Game, Penetrating the Secret Society of Pickup Artists, which chronicled his transformation from a shy nerd to a master seducer whose moves were revered throughout the international seduction community. Where is Neil? Master seducer. <laughs> Neil. <laughs> OK. OK. <laughs> Sorry. 
Strauss also has written several other New York Times bestsellers, including Rules of the Game, Emergency, and Everyone Loves You When You're Dead, as well as Motley Crue's The Dirt and Marilyn Manson's The Long Hard Road Out of Hell. <laughs> His latest work, The Truth, an uncomfortable book about relationships, was just published by Harper Collins, and from what I understand is now Number one on the New York Times bestseller list? Not number one, but on it. On it. Okay, I'm on jealous it. of the number one. Oh, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Neil. Thank you. Next, we are very lucky to have Dr. Gail Saltz join the conversation. Dr. Gail Saltz is a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at New York Presbyterian Hospital and a psychoanalyst with the New York Psychoanalytic Institute. Dr. Saltz is one of the country's leading experts on women's emotional health, sex, and relationship issues and is a regular contributor in the national media. She appears frequently on the Today Show, The View, Dateline, Fox News, CNN, and CBS This Morning, and is often quoted in publications such as Newsweek, Town & Country, and The New York Times. Dr. Saltz also is the Emotional Wellness Contributing Editor for Health Magazine, Chair of the 92nd Street Wise Seven Days of Genius Advisory Committee, and a consultant for the Clinton Foundation's Health Matters Initiative. She is the best-selling author of a number of books, including The Ripple Effect, How Better Sex Can Lead to a Better Life. Welcome, Dr. Saltz. And finally, let me introduce Professor Peter Tui, who flew all the way from Canada to be with us here tonight. Peter Tui taught for many years in his native Australia and is currently a professor of classics in the Department of Greek and Roman Studies at the University of Calgary. He has a special interest in the nature and history of emotions. His most recent books are Jealousy, Boredom, A Lively History, and Melancholy, Love, and Time, Boundaries of the Self in Ancient Literature. Let's give a warm welcome to all our speakers. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about this thing called jealousy. So, by the way, that introduction, there's yeah. a more amusing topic oh. happening next week. Yes. Like, we're starting a deficit. So, oh. <laughs> we're going to make jealousy exciting jealousy. and sexy okay. for you guys. <laughs> so, jealousy, what is this thing called jealousy? And how do we define it? What is jealousy anyway? He wrote the book. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. The only person who's allowed to ask that has got to be bald and gray haired <laughs> and, and have an Australian accent. So, um, the usual way to distinguish them is to say that um, jealousy is about loss and envy is about gain. But if you step back a little, what's jealousy? There's usually three elements to it, which can be three people. It can even be two people in a thing. If you're talking about sexual jealousy, it's probably three people. But the probably. Um, you know what I mean by a thing. You can be jealous over uh, another person's advancement, their money, their possessions, and so on. But so in the, uh, in the three people, one person is going to be threatened by the loss of, let us say, the central person. That's the jealous situation. So the, the loss and emotions are going to have to run high. Whether you would call it jealousy if people are not getting worked up, I don't honestly know. But possibly, possibly you would, possibly you wouldn't. But at any rate, we're saying three people, one threatened, and uh, her feelings are running high. Envy is a different matter. It's still going to be triangular. There's still going to be three people or two people and a thing involved, but it's going to be something like you would like to have what another person has. So teenagers, I guess at school, we're talking about, let's say, two boys fancy a particular girl. Now, this is probably as much about possession, I mean in the material sense, than anything else, but... Um, there it's about gain for both the boys, isn't it? Well, loss for the one who, who misses out, but nonetheless, uh, he didn't gain. So there's the distinction. Um, I guess we, we finally, we make the distinction too in the force of the words, that if you were to come up to me afterwards and say, um, you know, you, you envied me my masculine physique, well, after I'd laughed at you, I'd say, that's okay, you can feel that way. Um, <laughs> If you come up and said you were jealous, I'd look at you and say, what do you mean? What do you mean? So jealousy is a much stronger word for us, isn't it? So whatever it is, it carries a lot more emotional cachet, mostly, uh, than envy does. That, that I think, introduces okay. us. And, and I'm thinking as Peter talks that there's probably a part of jealousy that's like a weak sense of self, that 
if it's about loss, it's if this thing, which I believe that I own or possess, which we don't own or possess at all, if it's taken away from me, I'm somehow diminished. So I think a lot of it comes from sort of a, a weak sense of self. Dr. Salt? Um, well, I think actually making the distinction of the definitions mm -hmm. is, is maybe not so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I would say. Yeah. It's not so important because people do use them interchangeably. Right. It's, it's more the intensity of your feeling state, which is sort of uh, somewhere between a grieving, uh, anger. And um, I, I think, uh, you know, this really comes out of, to some degree, a, a biological imperative. You know, mm -hmm. evolution, from an evolutionary perspective, mm -hmm. we are wired to... Um, you know, you come into this world and you want your parents' attention. Um, and maybe even, let's say you want initially your mother's attention and you don't want her to pay attention to your father. You're, there's a triangle. Um, and along comes a sibling. Um, in a child's mind, you know, there's a finite pie here and they want the biggest piece. So now there's another triangle. And for survival purposes, right, it was, it's important to have your parents' attention and from a, uh, passing of your genes perspective, it's important for a man to know that his, his mate has been faithful to him so that he knows that those are his genes. It's important for her to know um, that she can hold his attention and he won't stray off to another woman because at some point, right, women had to be provided for in order to survive. Jealousy and envy, it makes sense from a biology perspective. Now, of course, we're living in a very different time and uh, you don't need someone to hunt for you and you um, have uh, afternoon shows to tell you whether you have paternity or not. Um, you, don't, you don't need these things, but the, you know, we don't evolve at such a rate that those things go away. So we have still very much, it's very normal, I think, to have the, this intensity of feeling about right. being primary. Right. I'd like to get into some of the science involved in jealousy a little bit later, but what I'm thinking about is like jealousy is not just one emotion, right? It's kind of a complex emotion that involves so many other emotions, right? Anger, fear. Um, it's kind of a little bit, maybe a little bit different for everybody, I don't know. But um, uh, I'm curious also, we know that jealousy plays such an important force in art and literature. And we have referred earlier tonight to Othello and Othello syndrome, as we call it, with. Uh, kind of almost pathological jealousy. Um, where do you see, I know Dr. Tui, I know you looked at jealousy in art and literature. Um, what are kind of some memorable examples of jealousy, uh, you know, that maybe illustrates how hard jealousy is to depict or describe in general, even for artists and writers? Yes, you, you mean visual yeah. art. Right, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, but to paint uh, jealousy seems to me almost an impossible thing. At least you can't paint the emotions. You can paint the situation that I've been talking about. That, that Strindberg, um, you know, Miss Julie and so on. There was a version that's just come out, Live Almond's version. So he's sort of in the air again, who I think was one of the most interesting sort of quasi-lunatics that, that you could find. He wanted to paint how the emotion felt. So it's, it's almost abstract expressionism in 1893 before the art, and it's supposed to be a storm over the sea. There's a juniper bush in it. Well, I can't find any of them. But it's, um, I don't know, perhaps that's how your mind feels when you're uh, in, in a state of profound jealousy. It didn't really work, because you could look at it and say, um, August, that's not uh, jealousy. That's how I feel when I'm angry. It didn't have any lasting influence. I think the, 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 the most persistent painter of, of jealousy with which I'm familiar with is Munch. And it's of no surprise, is it? Because uh, Munch's enormous popularity in just about any country is because of his ability to, to depict emotion, but he can also depict the situation. So his, uh, his jealous people are in triangles, the most famous one from about 1895, Everything's 1895 because I can't remember any other dates for these things. <laughs> but it's about that date. Um, Is has, this the one with the woman? The woman, the. the that's right, Dagny Jewell, yes. She's, she's standing at the back in what looks like a red dressing ground, reaching up to a tree behind her like this, taking an apple down from the tree. So there you've got the, the tree of life and uh, Adam and Eve operating. Next to her is Mork. Um, he's clad and he's sort of turned slightly to her. If you've got the picture, and at the very front, 
is a man whose name is Stanislav, and it begins with a P, and I cannot say it. It's an enormously long uh, uh, Polish name. Um, but I'm not going to try and do it. It would be rude to, to, to Polish speakers. But at any rate, he has a little rat's face with a little pointy beard, and you've probably seen it. He peers out of the picture um, with the two people, his wife and Munk behind it. And Munk had, had an affair two months after... Um, after his friend Stanis, Stanislav married uh, Dagny Duell, he painted that face of the jealous man, which wasn't him, again and again and again. The last painting I know was done in 1929. So this is 34 years after the first one. I think Munch died about 1944 or something like that. But so he came back and back and back to it, and yet he wasn't painting himself. He was painting, in fact, his friend. Perhaps it was this this lasting guilt, the way he treated him. I'm not I'm just sure. going to say that, um, because we know that he, he had an anxiety disorder, right, Monk? He, the, the scream and he had panic disorder and anxiety disorder. And being the object of jealousy is, is scary. Experiencing jealousy is also frightening. Um, right. it's, uh, it's an overwhelming feeling of you know, anger, but also shame mm -hmm. to be feeling often sort of violent thoughts about, about someone else. Um, so it would kind of go together for somebody who really struggled with his own anxiety to, um, yet he did something, you know, that would be considered a, quite a moral transgression against a friend and then, um, and then experience this uh, need to keep, um, you know, it, uh, painters often. But it's a little, it's also interesting because we talk about Othello and the green-eyed monster, and I think the color green is often associated with maybe jealousy or this green-eyed monster, but you also, I, I know you mentioned that yellow is also, it's not just green, it's also the color yellow, and certain classic symbols in, in art are some kind of symbols of jealousy. It's, it's yellow you, in yeah. most, uh, but there any it's German It's more yellow than green in? then? Is it like it's a, yellow in yeah. German, it's yellow in Danish, it's yellow in Spanish. Uh, it's yellow in Serbian, I discovered this week. That's as many as I know. But mm -hmm. yellow seems to be the dominant colour. Oh, and not green? No, no I think a green is from probably Anglo, and it's uh -huh. from Shakespeare. Okay. And then you also talk about some of the classic signs of... You talk a lot about um, uh, ears and eyes as symbols of jealousy and what they mean. Yes. Why, why are the, the eyes and ears so important in the depiction of jealousy in art? I what is it about? Probably you, you guessed yeah. the, the answer to that as, as almost as we put the question, right. how do you find out? You hear um, and then you look or you look and you hear, but it's the ears and the eyes that are the, the purveyors of the, uh, of the infidelity as you understand it. And they may be getting it wrong, but uh, once again, it's, if we went back to Munch's picture, the, his friend Stanislav, uh, has bug eyes that stick out of his head. And this is something that you get in most paintings that deal with jealousy, these sort of bug eyes. Uh, ears, you get a lot, particularly linked with surveillance. That's outside our remit, but it's linked with jealousy. There's a, uh, a, a street, uh, there's a group of street artists from Milan who are putting ears all over Europe at the minute. I don't know whether you've seen them. They're terrific. They do yellow, green, and, uh, and pink ears and so on, and mention the notion of surveillance. So this is, uh, it, it's part of, the, part of the imagery that we're speaking of, the eyes and the ears. Can, can I ask you out of curiosity? Because I was, obviously you could have written a book, and you did a book on boredom before about any sort of subject. What, what's your personal relationship to jealousy that made you think I want to dedicate this much time to exploring it? I, I'm, uh, that, everybody asks Fair me question. that, and I'm okay Fair to question. say I get as bored as crazy, so I wrote a book about boredom. Melancholy's okay. If I told you I'm as jealous as crazy, everybody would drive me out of this room. So <laughs> I'm not saying. <laughs> so, so, but it's, it's a, a safe space. space. Yeah, it's a safe space. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in painful emotions that can be often turned to... Uh, um, to people's advantage, and that's really my argument, the long argument in a pretty short book, that uh, jealousy is, in fact, a very good and very healthy thing. Um, 
but it takes a while to reach that conclusion. And I can feel you uh, worried about what I've said over there already. <laughs> no, I know. I just want to see. I just want to know what's beneath the surface right. here. I want to, there's there's <laughs> more. Gonna, there's yeah. a calm, placid lake here, but underneath there, yeah. I'm curious. I want to know what's going on. Can I, I'm curious just for the audience here, since we're kind of a small group. How many people feel more they're, they're, they're more jealous people, more the object of, of jealousy, or both? Or so, both. So I'll ask those three questions. So who feels they're more the object of others' jealousy? Cool, all wow. cocky people in the room, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and who feels like they're more jealous? That's a the thing they, awesome. Who feels they're both? They've been on both sides, the jealousy thing. And who feels like just no relationship whatsoever to jealousy, because you're, Not. <laughs> all right, a couple sociopaths. Yeah. No, just kidding, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> But, but you know, it's, it's really, it's interesting. It's really across the board. That was like a really even right. spread of right. people. Yeah. And I think like, I think like maybe, this is my thought on jealousy, which again has, I'm the only one on the stage besides Eric who's like not a doctor. So, <laughs> so. You're a doctor of sorts. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I have a lot of experience. <laughs> getting an honorary degree um, somewhere. <laughs> which is, which is uh, that, and I'd be curious what you guys think too, and especially you since this is your metier, is uh, that I feel like, it comes from a fear of, the, of abandonment. Like they did kind of studies and correlations and a lot of people who, who are more, uh, you know, have a higher degree of insecurity or more unstable, have a higher degree of uh, jealousy. And I feel like it comes from a childhood fear, you know, of abandonment, that I was not lovable and dad left me or mom left me. And thus, you're gonna leave me and replicate that wound and I can't take that pain again. I mean, I think, there, I think that um, some people have a hard wiring. Mm -hmm. They are more temperamentally, let's say, predisposed. So maybe people who um, are, um, you know, temperamentally, let's say, you know, somewhat more aggressive um, or struggle with containing, you know, intense emotion, feel easily lit up, um, um, you know, might already start experiencing the world in a certain kind of way so that even if they didn't have a parent abandon them or something like that, that they might move more in that direction, but certainly being stoked by the environment. So having a trauma, having, you know, seeing that, I mean, I've certainly had plenty of patients where, you know, one parent cheated on the other. Um, they became aware. The parent asked them to keep it a secret. Um, you know, they, the, their, their experience of trust has really been breached. Um, and, and, uh, or, you know, one child was clearly preferred in the family. It wasn't them. Um, and, and that has really stirred things for them. So, so I think, you know, I think both things can be true. Now, there are people who really develop, you know, what would be called sort of paranoid personality disorder um, or, um, you know, really struggle with paranoia. Sort of, it's not that nothing ever happens to them. They're always seeds of truth, but they experience everything as, you know, an attack at some level or another. And they may see abandonment right and left. They may go on to have, um, you know, intense jealousy that's more of a pathologic variety of feeling, um, uh, that uh, this is always happening to them or it's intensely happening to them. I see couples where um, one person is intensely jealous uh, so much of the time that ultimately in a way by a psychological mechanism called projective identification, they kind of push their partner to cheat on them. Um, you know, sort of like if I, if I have to pay for the crime, you know, if I have to do the time, I might as well do the crime. You know, like I'm constantly being um, suspect. So I think, I think both of these, there's, there's clearly some potential biologic hot-headedness, let's say, toward jealousy. Um, and then there's a, certainly the environmental impact that And there, I mean, there's also abandonment that we're not, one's not aware of, it's not typically seen as that, it's just emotional abandonment. You get, you know, mom or dad may always say, I love you growing up, but yet they're not there, and yet they're always working, and the only time they connect is when they're pushing you to succeed, and that's still, so it's confusing what's love. That they're not loving you for, for you, they're loving you for your achievement or the gold star, or something that brings them, let's say, narcissistic pleasure. Like right. it makes them look good, and by extension, you're making them look good. So that now that you know that type of parenting situation often creates another narcissist, right? Who that has the, narcissist is not such a dirty word. <laughs> um, you know, we think of that as just the arrogant, like, you know, blowhard, really uh, difficult, self-centered person. But really, narcissism, true narcissism, means this intense insecurity underneath mm -hmm. and the need to create these grandiose fantasies to keep at bay those terrible, insecure feelings. And I think, yes, people um, who are narcissistic um, may be intensely jealous. They're, they're mm -hmm. constantly sort of coveting Right. You know, the grandiose anything that anyone else has. Right. And, and that's honestly when jealousy can get scary because your sense of self, if, if I'm this great, you wouldn't leave me. And that's threatening my entire sense of self. So Absolutely. I'll do whatever it takes 
for you not to leave me. Yes. And that's when it becomes, right. I mean, deadly. Like there's something like um, 49, something like almost 50% almost of all like women between like 15 and 44 who are murdered, it's by an intimate partner. Absolutely. Right. So it's, I mean, it's a terrifying, I mean, I don't. Well, those are yeah. also more, you know, the extreme cases of jealousy, but just mm -hmm. some people are also just always on the lookout for jealousy, right? They're kind of always looking for signs of jealousy even when there's nothing there. Right, and uh, well, if you, you know, look we at the numbers of on infidelity. Crier before, who was here last time, her husband Alain Rob Crier was also a very famous author, and he wrote a book called La Jalousie, and La Jalousie in French, it's um, like a, it's you know those window, like a Venetian blind, Venetian. the Venetian blind window where you can kind of peek through, and the, his whole book was about the characters peeking, peeking out the window because he suspects the the wife is having an affair with a neighbor, um, and it's. It's a very interesting book because the jealous, you, you don't even, uh, je the jealousy is the character in the book. It's uh, a great, very interesting, great right? book yes. for eyes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. about the eyes. You know, and something yeah. sticking in my head for what Gail said. Yeah. I just want yeah, to, so ahead. you were saying some people can push their partners to do it, but how do they, you can't make somebody cheat, you know what I mean? Like, yes. Unless, unless you have a cuckold fetish and you're like, please do this for me so I can get off on right, it. Right, right, right. It's not, uh, I, when I say make, and that's a, that's a very good point because, you know, one thing about, whether we're talking about jealousy or shame or, um, you know, is it wrong to be jealous? I mean, it's hard for people to keep in mind, but thoughts are just thoughts. Mm -hmm. Feelings are just feelings, unless you're unaware of them, and then they may drive behavior. So, so you know, if, you, if your partner is constantly questioning you and accusing you all the time, it's not, you know, they didn't physically make you go out and cheat, but it sort of wears away at you to a point where you think, maybe, maybe I do want to cheat, you know? In other words, they're, they're constantly telling me, I am, I want to, I, you that just start sounds to like some, It sounds feel, like something a cheater would say is an excuse. You made me do it because you didn't trust me. You know, and, and, and that happens too. <laughs> right. But, um, of course, I see, I, I actually would take issue with, you know, those are extreme cases, perhaps, mm -hmm. that yes. he was mentioning. Yeah. But, you know, if you look at numbers today in terms of infidelity and what's happening to right. marriage um, and monogamy, um, there are a lot of people cheating. I, I mean, there are a lot of both men and women. Women are gaining on men. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, um, and, and you know, that's, you know, whether we're talking about a sexual affair, an emotional affair, um, you know, the numbers are actually pretty big and it, and it certainly can drive people to, um, to be yeah. extremely active. So I don't want to say, hey, that's a license to cheat and he made me do it <laughs> right. in the court of here, law. Here, here, here's here's the, my thought, and again, I'm like, but psychologically, it does wear away at people. Here, here's, here's what I think happens. And by the way, speaking of figures, I, so I, I just did this book, and I'm an obsessive fact checker. So originally, I had the fact that 76% of people in relationships cheat. Then I researched it, and literally, if you look at the research, depending on what research you talk to, it goes from 13% to 76%. And first of all, who, who's, fake, who's honest on a right, survey right, that they that's cheated? That's a problem. Most you people compartmentalize right. it right. or it didn't count because we're kind of breaking up. Or, or whatever it is. So it's right. really like any, I would doubt any number on relationships, even the divorce statistics, like the most recent one is like a, 19, a census figure from the 70s or 80s. <laughs> like, and people just use what's convenient. And in fact, I got so mm -hmm. obsessed trying mm -hmm. to figure out the divorce, supposedly it's 50%, the remarriage, mm -hmm. which is supposedly 76%, second remarriage, 83%. But so I went and talked to the researcher who was credited with this research. I literally called them. And they said, I never said this. I don't know how to stop this fact. Oh. <laughs> so if you like really. Does he know the fact? Wow. Did he give you the uh, accurate one? She. Or she? Interesting okay, that yes. you jumped to that conclusion. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a she and, uh, and no, she, no she, I don't, she has a no idea no how idea that started. No idea where it even started. So really like if you, when I trace psychological sort of uh, research down to the point, right. it almost never holds up. Mm -hmm. uh, not, over 90% of psychological uh, um, Research uh, proves the research's original point. So you wonder, anyway, right. mm -hmm. but here's the point yeah. I was gonna make. So you're talking about the person who's really needy and insecure in a relationship. There's a common pattern, I'm sure you know it. And there's, there's reasons why people kind of meet and attract. There's a line like, a, you know, if it's love at first sight, run in the other direction. Because all, <laughs> all it means is your wounds have met their wounds, both be, trying to be healed by the same, you know, issues that, 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 that hurt them in the first place. Mm -hmm. So there's a common pattern, I think you, you, pro you probably agree, is that so somebody who has kind of anxious attachment, right? So they're super anxious. They always think somebody is going to be attracted to somebody who's by nature unavailable. And that's just a common pattern. And so it isn't like, oh, you were so needy that you made me cheat. It's like this person 
uh, was already predisposed, mm -hmm. once they feel smothered, mm -hmm. to pop holes in the vacuum bag of their relationship. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a common mm -hmm. pattern. It's two, there's nothing wrong with one person in a relationship. They're both together and both equally functional or dysfunctional. Right. One of the things that worries me just a little, <laughs> inspired by your scepticism of right. statistics, and that makes right. sense to me, I mean, you seem to be able to find what you need, is that um, it was okay for the, for the God of the Old Testament to say, you know, I am, I am the Lord thy God and I am a jealous God, right. whatever he meant. I think he meant, you know, that, that he was jealous if you had false gods before him or something like that. Jealousy's had a bad rap from St. Paul onwards, and I would have... I would have said, and I think when I started to think about jealousy, I thought, anything that St. Paul says is bad, I'm going to think is good. It's a good research principle. <laughs> I really believe that. That is to say, jealousy has had a bad rap from the, uh, the uh, early Christian church just about onwards. And strangely enough, it morphs into, into the modern times where if you are... Um, if you are and I say this with no opprobrium, I mean, but, but with agreement, if you're mildly left-wing and libertarian and tolerably permissive, then you will say, no, jealousy's a bad thing. You should be able to share. Don't be insecure. And I think, boy, St. Paul's still reaching out, isn't he? Except he's changed political sides. Now, this is not an argument for anything other than my own suspicion that somewhere along the line, if, as, as Gail is saying, this is a hardwired emotion, mm -hmm. Is any emotion bad? Now, I don't mean you have to do it, but is anger bad? Well, yes, but it's not if it protects your family, um, and so, so on and so forth. So I think, to, to a degree, the challenge that St. Paul mounts for us is, can we see anything good in jealousy? Can anything come out of it? All emotions must have have value for creatures. So I mean, how much of jealousy do you think is nature versus nurture? I think it's totally nature. You do? Yeah, yeah. It's I hardwired, mean, it's an evolutionary... Yeah. It's hardwired into us, but of course... It's I think it's both. I mean, I, I think, you know, it is hard. I, I think everybody experiences some of it and certainly create the right circumstances and anybody would experience it, but some people are, as we were talking about, certainly more predisposed than others, and I do think experience uh, definitely does change that. And I also think it changes the likelihood that um, something might be experienced as a feeling that they can manage versus something that they then need to put into an action that is mm -hmm. self-destructive or destructive to someone else. And I think it's, it's also interesting that the jealousy is not unique to humans, right? Mm, People talk right. about their dogs being jealous, but somebody, uh, the, 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 uh, Richard Burton in, in his Anatomy of Melancholy argues that most animals can experience jealousy, and he goes on to say dogs, horses, goats, bulls, camels, and crocodiles, and apparently the most jealous animal is the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> I would not want to make an elephant right. jealous. <laughs> it's, it's not the biggest way to say that. He would never lie to us. <laughs> and to put a point yeah. on what Peter said, I think yeah. everyone, and the emotions have a functional and a dysfunctional range. So assertiveness is the nice side of anger. Rage is the hmm. you know, negative side, again, unless you're really protecting mm -hmm. something. And again, jealousy can amp up desire and, and, and be kind of sexy and, mm -hmm. and make you really desire your partner and, and, and feel one and it's nice stuff. And then the dysfunctional side is when the emotion is running you. Yeah, right. Yeah. But that's the case with any emotion, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Without right. talking of the, uh, the range of anger, anger can be bad if it's not controlled. Kindness can be bad if it's not controlled. If my student comes and says, "Can't you give me an A so I can get into, you know, out of into med school?" and you say, "Oh, all right." Well, that's bad kindness, is it not? You know, I mean, I might go under their knife, but um, so any emotion can be bad. So what do you think, can you elaborate a little bit more? Like, what are the benefits of jealousy? Like, how can jealousy help and, you know, strengthen your relationship? That's, this, I'm into your territory. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I would argue that um, a certain amount of, I, I, you know, jealousy almost seems like too strong a word, but it is mm -hmm. jealousy at the mildest end, but it, a desire to protect your relationship mm -hmm. um, does just that. You know, that um, uh, people who at least profess to have Zero jealousy whatsoever. You know, you want my wife? Take her. Do you think it's possible? Do um, some people, you know, when people I, say, oh, I'm not jealous at all, right? You know, so it's, we, right? it's hard for uh, me to think say. Really I, think it's, I think it's pretty yeah. rare if it exists. Right. Okay. Um, I have had people mm -hmm. tell me, you know, as a clinician, you know, you know I really want to know, you know, what do you think about um, 
us having a threesome or going to the swing party mm -hmm. and so on because really, I'm really fine with it. You know, it just doesn't bother me at all. I don't feel jealous. Um, more often than not, if they do that, over time, they, d they do become jealous and they can't erase the memory of what they've seen or what they've experienced mm -hmm. and then they grow. And, you know, well, what did she really think about that act that she had with that other person mm -hmm. and was it better than mine? Then you start the competition. So um, I, I find ultimately it does erode away, but what, what can be good is um, to go to back to your original book, people can become bored in a relationship mm -hmm. and complacent. Um, or feel at a certain time, you know, this person isn't really exciting for me right now. They're not really making me happy right now. It may actually have nothing to do with that other person. It may have completely, in fact, often I think it completely has to do with the person themselves who's, who's, who's saying, oh, why isn't my partner making me happy? But in that setting, um, you know, letting go and not protecting your relationship at all mm -hmm. is often destructive to the relationship at the end of the day. So, for instance, you know, I, I, a couple comes in, I said, well, why, why do you feel it's fine if he goes after work every night and has drinks with these women that you feel are very attractive at the office, and he stays, and he goes, and he travels, and he's staying in the hotel or with her? Or why is that fine? Um, because often, couples find themselves shocked when someone becomes involved in a relationship. And it really wasn't shocking at all. Right? It was a certain complacency. So having a protective feeling of like, I need to, you know, this is my person, mm -hmm. and I do want to keep this person. <laughs> um, what do I need to think about to do that? What are the high-risk events? Um, even though we trust each other, we have great communication, we have a wonderful relationship, do I want my partner to be in a high-risk event? Probably not. So, so all these are in of themselves high-risk events where it's, you know, it, it obviously it depends, right. but what I'm saying is that having a certain amount of jealousy, jealousy in the form of mm -hmm. I covet this, I want this, I'm willing to compete for this, mm -hmm. and I do that, that can be a good thing. I think in a romantic relationship as anything else, but you know, more often than not it goes further than that and then it's not a good thing. Or you're unaware that you're even feeling that way, so you're just acting on it in a way that actually ends up being destructive to the relationship. What, do you want to add to that, Neil? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so <laughs> I'm, I'm dying to, to so I think part of the reason I'm up here is because in, in the book I just wrote, I Do you want to explain a little bit sure. like, about your, yeah, the game sure. book and the, a little bit of the history well, talk, for people? Yeah. The okay, the new book. Okay. Not because it's new, just because right, it yeah. speaks to what we're okay. talking about. Um, is, uh, first of all, I would question the idea of any high-risk event. To me, with my wife, there's, I, so yesterday, here's what my wife did yesterday. She has a friend who's a dominatrix, right? The dominatrix had somebody going, oh, this is about to get interesting, guys. <laughs> so it was already interesting before, but so the dominatrix, like, she rented a hotel suite because a guy wanted to be kicked in the balls repeatedly for $500. Um, so, and so she's like, but he wants to do this during a yoga session. So he invited my wife and a few other people, a few of her female friends, to sort of be doing yoga while the guy came to the yoga class and got kicked in the balls repeatedly for, for doing wrong things. And I guess that might be a high-risk situation. Is this in California? Of, this, uh, yeah, you know, it happens everywhere. You oh, know, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it happens everywhere. We just well, don't wait, know. This wasn't high-risk for your wife. <laughs> right. What, what I'm saying is, for, for me, like, I'm cool with whatever she wants to do and wherever she wants to go, whoever she's with, because she's entitled to make her own decisions. Okay. In other words, she's a grown adult, right? There's no, no such thing as a high-risk situation because of this. Say she goes somewhere and something happens, Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. I'm, I have no interest in controlling, in controlling her. Honesty is what is important to me. But if she meets somebody... So as long as she comes up at the end of the day and say, I, I fucked so-and-so, that's okay. No. She doesn't even get into the sense that if she meets somebody who she feels may be more romantically right for her, then she should be with that person. She should, someone should be with a person who's right for them. I don't want to say, you need to be with me right. forever because we're together. I need, you need to do what's right for you. And it's also right for me if you don't feel that that's not right. Have you always felt this way, or did you come to this? Uh, and by the way, that's like, it in theory. Now, yeah. let me tell you in practice. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm waiting for the next book. I'm waiting for the next book. Here it is in practice. Here it is in practice. I don't but, see this going but, right, well. Right. But, 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 but uh, what 100%, like, someone is not a possession, and we do not control them, and it doesn't have to be forever. Period. So, that said, I decided, you know what? Monogamy doesn't make sense. I'm going to sort of explore the other relationships and see what's right for me. And, and I thought, and I, I, with this theory, by the way, I, just, I gotta, what's great about doing the books I write is I actually go do them versus 
staying up here. So right. immersive journalism. So, uh, so I decided. So I decided to. So I decided to open up my relationship. And uh, about four days later, she went to to Mexico uh, to Cancun with two other two guys. I'm like, okay, okay, there's a good chance to kind of test out how I feel about it. And how did it go? Do you guys think? <laughs> how did it go? Um, I was just ripped apart. I was just <laughs> torn apart. I logically knew. And here's the thing about jealousy, right? Like you can really intellectually say, oh, I don't feel jealous. I'd be good with that. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they were gone, even though I knew they may not be the right person forever, I was just like in total pain, like literally lying on the yeah. couch, like so what heart were you ripping feeling? out. What were, like, what were you, I mean, what, what did you think was going to happen that was torturing you um, that you didn't know? No. I mean, is, is, was it in your mind or? It was all, so, so I talked to, so I talked to kind of like when you're in pain of the heart right. or any kind of pain, it's a great way to get to know yourself. <laughs> You know, and really explore, hey, what's going on? And it was all about fears. It was, you know, fear of abandonment, fear of not being enough, fear that, so, you know, someone else is better than me, fear that she's having a better time with them mm -hmm. than me. You know, all these fears. By the way, the best part is so she called and me. did she have a better time? Um, you know what? what? Happened? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? She had a good time. <laughs> and uh, and, and her, the, only, the only harmful thing in the relationship about the right. experience was my own emotions about it. Right. So Did she, she come, was she honest with you when she came back? Yeah, yeah. He, tell, here's the greatest line yeah. ever. She, so she goes, she goes, don't worry. And tell me what you guys would think. Don't worry. I didn't fuck anyone or give them a blowjob. So I instantly assumed she gave everybody hand jobs, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so but, but, but here's the thing. I've talked to, like, again, I'll go through these experiences. I'll talk to experts to understand them. So a few terms that we can teach you guys. You can go home tonight in case you want to do this yourself. Uh, is, by the way, how many people are in a non-monogamous or have had an open or non-monogamous relationship? So a few people. Great. Awesome. So, yeah, about eight people in the audience. So there's something called the burning period. The burning period is the amount of time it takes to adjust to the emotions and feelings that come up once you open a relationship. So it doesn't mean that it's impossible. It means that you can work on them and, and, and work it through. It's just, it's just like your first relationship, just like your first job. It doesn't always go perfectly. You can work it through. And I talk to like a lot of swingers. I talk to a lot of people in that community. Mm -hmm. And I'll share a couple thoughts and then. Whose uh, term is this, the burning period? Is uh, this the, your it, term or is this a which professional is great. term? It's a professional, a professional it's a term. professional term, okay. What's going on is yeah. in the non-monogamous non communities, yeah. there's new things happening. Okay. New dynamics, new, uh, new intersections, and right. they need a new language to chart okay. this kind of less explored zone of relationships. Mm -hmm. There's the idea of meta, I, I can share yeah. a couple of the terms, well, they're interesting. Okay. Does anyone know what a metamor is? Couple of people. You maybe read my book. No, is that why? Do you know it already? No. Or did you read the book? What's that? I don't know. It's your partner's other partner. Yeah, exactly. It's your partner's other partner. Your metamors are if you have three partners, they're metamors. And a polyamorous situation works mm -hmm. depending on their relationship with each other. Um, but my favorite term, and I thought it would be interesting to talk yeah. about tonight, and yeah. be curious what you guys think. Have you guys ever heard of compersion? What? Compersion. Does anyone know what that is? Compersion? <laughs> awesome. So compersion is the opposite of jealousy. Mm -hmm. Right? Compersion is the opposite of jealousy. So what's, what's the opposite? Well, what's the opposite of jealousy? Well, you feel good about what, but you know, for but, the other but person now. To be fair, that, uh, that comes out of yeah. the uh, uh, Eastern and, uh, I can't think of the name of the book. Eastern and, do you know the book? No, it's, I don't know the origin of it. I'd love to know. The, um, oh, I'll have to look it up and tell you yeah. afterwards. But, um, it happened in 1795, right? <laughs> the, uh, no, 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 no. There was a new edition just a couple of years <laughs> it's ago. It's, it's the standard book on poly. Uh, polyamorous relationships. Oh, love without limits, or no, 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 no. East, uh, the main. Anybody know it? The main author is uh, her name's Easton. Ethical the ethical slut. Das, ethical yes, slut. the ethical yeah. slut. That's it. The ethical slut. Right. Yeah, great book. Yeah. So the idea no, is it's a, it's a yeah, very so, humane right. book. I like. Yeah. She uses so the can term. So can you, Neil? Can you? Yeah, I'll just say in a nutshell. What, 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 the what, I, what I, right. Why I brought it up though yeah. is she's pretty straightforward and open about jealousy, and she says. If you are in a polyamorous situation and people are saying to you, no, you're, 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 you're weak, you're, you're feeling jealous, fight them. It's a normal emotion. She thinks you're going to have to work through it, and it can be worked through, but the only way to deal with it is to be honest. The, the, um, she, she, uh, she talks about a sort of, uh, well, at any rate, um, in, in the world, she used the, the, slut, the, the slut world as she uses it, jealousy, she says, is the norm, but it, it's a, it's, it can be worked through, she feels. So I think, you know, she doesn't believe it's all compersion as, as soon as you sign on to polyamory, is, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I'll explain the term. It takes a high level, it really takes a high level of communication. 
to do these things. But compersion is the idea, hey, if you're my partner and I love you, right. then I'm happy that you're happy, even if that happiness doesn't involve me. So compersion is if you're feeling happy, if you're with somebody, and there's another term is new relationship energy, right? You're together and there's that excitement. Well, if you're happy, So you I should have be been happy. happy for your friend who went to Mexico with And us. she had a good time. Right. right. So Right, compersion, you would, would have been happy for her. In retrospect, she, I feel compersion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then, uh, do you see any differences between how men versus women experience jealousy? What can we say about men versus women? I would, I would say there are often differences. I, I mean, to hark back to the, the biological mm -hmm. or evolutionary idea that, uh, you know, men need to know that, you know, that was their sperm. And that's their, their genes um, that they are taking care of. And, and, uh, and why do they need to know that? I mean, I she's mean, just, carrying the baby. Right, yeah. Then she knows it's hers. But, but you know, who inseminated right. her right. could be right. up for grabs. Right. So um, if, if, you, if, you, if you agree with this evolutionary mm -hmm. perspective, I would say what I, what I see on a day-to-day -day basis fits that model that, you know, for men, it's you know about the sexual protection of the genes, and for women, it is about the emotionally keeping him close as the provider. Um, I, you know, since sort of the term was coined, emotional affair, if you will, mm -hmm. I think that sort of you know really popped up since Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston. That whole thing went down. Everybody started talking a lot more about, oh, what, about what, was it an emotional affair? What? Um, but the idea that um, women are usually much more disturbed by an emotional attachment. Their partner's emotional attachments. And, well, do you love her? What, did, did you talk to her about us, our marriage? What The emotional aspect, um, not that they're not bothered by him having sex with somebody else, mm -hmm. but really disturbed by the emotional aspect. Um, and, and men are often less disturbed by the emotional aspect, but really cannot handle she had sex with somebody else. The, I mean, that would just be my clinical experience. Mm -hmm. but. There, was, there was some work, I think it's about 2007, by a Japanese fellow. I mean, I read this stuff. Why would anybody read it? But, but I mean, it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it was on jealousy. The man's name's Takahashi. And uh, um, some of you may have even come across it here. But, but uh, what, he's a neurologist, so he's interested in the relationship between the physical brain and the um, and the feeling of jealousy and what what his his initial questionnaires and so on using fMRI and so on discovered exactly what you're saying with women but then he was he attempted to map their responses onto the brain so he found that the male responses were associated with um, the uh, what with the limbic system with the uh, the hypothalamal system, these are, these are not highly, well, they are very emotional areas, but they're, maybe the way to explain it is the women's responses were linked with higher functioning um, emotional areas of the brain. So that whatever it is he argued, that there's, there's an actual physiological or at least a, a mental well, mapping basis. And so it's, there are right, differences. It's the right, it's the frontal lobe. Well, no, right? no, no, is it's, that it's, what it was? So the, you, the, the limbic the area, the yeah. hypothalamus, the amygdala, those are, mm -hmm. those are primitive emotional centers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and then they're connected to the prefrontal cortex, which is the part that says, uh, you know, what do I think about mm -hmm. this? What is my analysis of this? Or what is the consequence of this? And... Uh, you know, women are often touted as sort of more emotional because um, there's a sort of a different level of connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. So they may have this sort of more guttural emotional response that's less um, quickly digested by the analytic understanding of their emotional response. And yet it was the men with the amygdala, wasn't it? At least in Takahashi's work, it was the men with the amygdala and the women were, were somehow okay. bypassing it. So. What about this association that of... Uh, jealousy with being associated with some uh, brain degeneration. Uh, that's, I think that's I read something the, like, like that, that yeah, jealousy that's the is very common business. also in people over age 60. Frontotemporal dementia. That were in Alzheimer's patients and... and, and yes, uh, frontotemporal dementia. Right. You've got to correct me on this. Well, yeah. if you think what? about that, right, and dementia affects mm. prefrontal cortex, right. not deeper mm. emotional areas. So it would be less checked, if you will. So there's often a greater emotional expression of various kinds, um, you know, crying or, you know, emotional mm -hmm. expressions because it's less checked. And also when you have um, 
less correct input, if you will, because of dementia, than the ability to just say, trust the input that you're getting. So um, when things are missing, you know, that also leads to suspicion. So pe what you experience from the person with dementia is what's called confabulation, right? They make up stories to, ex you know, s tell you what they're trying to tell you and not show that they're missing something. Um, but in the missing something, it, makes, it can make people very suspicious, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take away someone's hearing, someone's sight, as you take away senses that help them, you know, ears and eyes to record what's going on, then you often do increase suspicion. My mother had vascular dementia. Uh, um, and when she was about three quarters of the way down the slope, she became immensely jealous of my, my father. And she'd go so far as to grab him by the and say, Vin, you've got a woman in here. You've got a woman in here. And I was talking to uh, a neurologist about this whose mother had suffered it well. And he looked at me. He's a quiet guy. And he said, did she have a mirror in her room? I said, what are you talking about? You probably mm. know what I'm saying. And he said, well, it happened to my mother, who uh, uh, she had Alzheimer's, not, not, uh, but at any rate, what he's saying is she saw herself in the mirror and didn't recognize who mm. she was. She'd completely lost her sense of self. The jealousy would then, was then the product of the phantom woman who was herself mm. in the mirror, but of course she still recognized my father, more or less. I thought that was one of the saddest, but most mm. uh, t extraordinary. I wouldn't have thought of that in, in mm. a lifetime. Mm. That mm. She'd look in the mirror and couldn't recognize herself. The self was gone. This was mm. an interloping woman of, mm. of 70 trying to take her husband away. Mm. Any rate, sorry. Again, I also think that it depends on like how your brain is wired growing up. Like mm -hmm. I talked to a geneticist because I wanted mm -hmm. to say, hey, am I stuck with the way I was raised and mm -hmm. I'm just doomed by 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 these by my by, by genes? Like in other words, with monogamy, um, there's a, they did studies on the, on, on voles because there's a kind of monogamous bowl and a slutty bowl. Uh, that's not the technical terms, but um, <laughs> but uh, but they did the studies on them and what they found was like the, if you have a if your genes code for a long vasopressin receptor. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's more likely to make you faithful. So I'm like, okay, good. You can just scan people before right. you date them and, and did they see scan if they're you? faithful. <laughs> uh, and were you scanned? Uh, yeah. No. So, so what he said, what he said was, I'm like, oh, cool. If that's easy, maybe there's just some vasopressin shots I could get, or you know, something like a like a gene transfer. <laughs> um, but but no, what he said was, <clears throat> most things, especially when it comes to be behavioral, are switched on by the environment. Yes. And and when you're so when you're growing up. Basically, like you're, you're, you're developing, like you're, you're born, I think most of your brain mass is there, but your neural connections, a lot of the architecture is not there. So in the first three years, your brain, like the connections are being made. Some studies say 700 you know, new neural connections a second in, in infants. But up to the age of three, like you're just forming these things so rapidly. So a three-year-old has twice as many neural connections as us. And then after that, a process called pruning takes place where those neural, they, they kind of, uh, uh, the ones you don't use go away. So how are these made and how are these not made? You know, it's by your parenting. So when, you, when you're hungry, is your need met or is it not met? You know, when you're... Uh, you're talking about epigenetics, that right. basically, yes, we're born with genes, but genes just turn off and on all the time because of environmental factors. Right. So really, in a sense, you're, you're, you're having genetic changes as you go, mm -hmm. and the brain really remains plastic through life. Of course, it slows down how, how much it can change, but um, in, to, answer, to, to your question of, you know, am I just stuck being whatever it is, a slutty bull, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, really, we, what we can see is not just that medication changes the brain, but that um, psychotherapy changes the brain. It changes because the brain, you know, it is about the connectivity, and the connectivity is, is the chemical release from one neuron to another neuron, and these things are changed by having experience. Exactly. So the experience of psychotherapy changes, changes your brain. You don't, you, you don't have to be a slutty bull right. if so you the don't point, want to be. And you can also be one if you want to be. <laughs> and you could so, be one if you want to be. So, but, the, but the point is this. Right. You don't have to like, wait for dementia and be like, I'm going to go crazy. You can actually work on yourself now right. and, 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 and become happier and more loving and more connected right. so that when, when, you're, when your prefrontal cortex withers away, <laughs> you're not going to be a paranoid mess. What, <laughs> what have you found in terms of like other cultures and jealousy or jealousy in other cultures? Or civilizations, or, or, or have there been periods or times there's, there's, of where there's, there's a... The evidence is never clear. Margaret yeah. Mead's the great one right. for here, but, but we could go backwards. I found, you, you know, into Rome, where you, you, you... What would you expect there? Who knows? But there's one, one inscription that a person showed me to a woman called uh, Hilar, Hilara Statilia. And uh, it's, the inscription is put up after she died, and it's put up by two men, and it's to her as their wife. 
There's also another linked inscription been found by one of her daughters and said she was the best mother since sliced bread or whatever it was the Romans had. But So there, there's a picture of what seems like an idyllic image of, of, of one woman to two husbands. But then I started talking to the person who works on this sort of ancient demography and these inscriptions says, could be, but then again... Um, she was a slave. She was probably a freed person by the time the inscription was put up. Um, she had a family. The family name meant that probably um, the, the master of that household, who I think was killed off by Nero or somebody like that, but at any rate, um, could have said, you will marry these two men because we've got a shortages of women in the house. That'll keep them quiet and make them more useful. So... Yeah. Who knows? You just don't know what that sort of evidence means. And I think when you come to Margaret Mead, the same problems come up. Were She didn't speak uh, Samoan. She spent, what, not much more than eight months there. Yeah. People have said since we were lying to her. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, I don't think there's data on this exactly, but, I mean, clearly there's jealousy, I think, in all cultures. We're mm -hmm. saying this is a human, it's right. a mammal condition. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, but cultures where um, there is more of a uh, preponderance of the idea of ownership of a person, mm -hmm. um, that that's an expectation in the culture, mm -hmm. um, uh, then if someone tries to remove themselves from that, clearly that does mm -hmm. stoke. So there, there are cultures where... Um, you know, partnership isn't necessarily on an even footing, per se. You know, I, I, she I, I, belongs to him. And then, you know, in, in cultures where, you know, if she were to stray, that would, you know, the death penalty is an appropriate punishment. I mean, there, there are certainly, you know, what is, what is culturally acceptable if you're, if you're viewed more as a clearly you belong to me um, does change the equation, I think. Somewhat, because I try to look a little bit into seeing who are the most jealous cultures, and I could only find one study that was like ten years old that that found that Brazilian men were the most jealous, mm. and Japanese women were the least. Mm. It's, uh, I and, mean, once again, it's the sort right. of evidence you, because yeah. if we were to go back to yeah. uh, to Romans, I mean, they are ex don't believe Hollywood. They are extremely companionate marriages and yeah. very happy marriages. The divorce rate was high, but it had nothing to do with the partners. It was the family, let's say, you know. It's politics, you've got to split up, but I like him, no. Um, <laughs> when when uh, jealousy emerges in ancient literature, it's quite, quite late when it becomes popular. It becomes with the Greek novel, and it comes around about 100, 150 of our era. And it comes at the same period that romantic love becomes a subject for literature. Mm -hmm. And as arranged marriage disappears. So I'd blame the Christians again. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the <laughs> But yeah, no, in the in the court It's the influence yeah. coming yeah. in that jealousy mm -hmm. is uh, is what it's the product of romantic love. It's probably the uh, um, the, the product of the, of the abandonment of parents making up their own minds who children should marry or the family. It's not so much parents. But it's, it's a queer thing, isn't it? When children can choose who they'll marry when they're marrying people the same age as them, they start to become jealous and it emerges as a, as a topic for literature. I, I, you know, that's a sobering, sobering fact, I think, because you used the word romantic of your relationship with with your wife, which made me wonder, right. you know, I thought, oh, you know. <laughs> and in, 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 the, in the courtly romances, uh, they, they say, like, he who is not jealous is not in love. Mm -hmm. And also, you ask about other cultures, and there are laws. But here's the thing, like, you can't, studying other, and again, I went yeah. down this kind of rabbit hole, but studying other cultures and evolution to decide how, what we should do with our hearts mm -hmm. is, like, a horrible idea. We should just kind of listen to our hearts and not see what other cultures mm -hmm. and people are doing. But as an example... Because what did you find? Well, well you, I, I'll give you a quick yeah, example yeah. of what you were talking about, is there are cultures from you know, Eastern, Western, that have laws on the books, mm -hmm. even in America until recently, that if a husband, if a wife cheated on a husband, and the husband killed her in a jealous rage, not just you're punished by death, but that was okay. That's allowed because, mm -hmm. you know, he, you, you were out of control. So does that mean jealousy is natural? If it does, it also means sexism is natural, right? Right. So you can't study this stuff because it's like, yeah, it's like what I really learned is this. I learned if we're looking... Again, like saying monogamy is not natural, or it is natural, jealousy is natural, not natural. See, so it feels like we're trying to justify something that we feel like we should be doing or feeling anyway. Mm. You know, it's up to you, and you have some say over that. So even though I felt jealousy when she went away to, and had that, Mexi that experience mm -hmm. in, in Mexico, uh, 
I felt like it was up to me to really figure out that emotion, what's functional and what's not functional. And, you know, I talked to a lot of swingers, for example, and the jealousy is the high of swinging. They're like, they like, if I can take that jealousy, I feel jealous when I see this guy, you know, having wild sex with, with my, my, my wife or my partner. And, uh, and I remember this one guy um, uh, who used to be a former child actor, not that yeah. it matters, but it's just funny. <laughs> um, so he's already got issues, right? Um, says, like, if I can take that you jealousy. You name him and in I, your book. Yeah, I know him yeah. in your book, whatever. <laughs> but um, but uh, he's like, if I can take that jealousy and I can just sort of control it, you know, it can turn into like a pleasure and a high. So the emotions are just these feelings of emotion. I call that masochism. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it's, yeah. I mean, and, and there are plenty of people who do feel, you right. know, that that's a total high for them. It's, it's emotional masochism, yeah. So then what could, I guess, the average person who maybe feels a little bit of jealousy, not out of, what, what advice would you have for that person? Do they need to see a therapist? Is there something that they can work on themselves to make them less jealous? Or this is something they just have to deal with? Well, since yeah. we're all saying yeah. that jealousy is a yeah, normal, normal human emotion, yeah. I, I, I think. Like when, when, when would you need to seek help for I mean, to me, I mean, if the more aware you can be of your emotional state, mm -hmm. the, the, better, the more conscious you are of what you're thinking and honest with yourself about what you're thinking, the less power those thoughts have over controlling your behavior, to doing something um, that, you know, at the end of the day, perhaps will not make you happy or will not make somebody else happy. Um, so I think, you know, it's normal to, and at PS, it's normal to not be happy all the time. So it's normal to suffer, be angry, be sad, be jealous, feel ashamed. Um, but it's a matter of, you know, um, are you communicating with yourself about that? Mm -hmm. Then when an emotional state um, starts to, take on a valence that affects your ability to function. So I can't function in my relationship because every time I open my mouth, I'm like, ah, you know, or um, I am, uh, you know, destroying my whatever, my chances at work or my, um, you know, uh, my relationship with my child. If, if you start ruining things and it affects your ability to function, that's when you should. So is it okay to be checking your partner's emails and snooping around and all? I mean, at what point is, that may be not so healthy. I, I don't think there's one yeah. answer to that. Yeah. Like, I don't think it's an on-off switch of okay, not okay. Um, uh, by know. the way, it's never okay to check your partner's emails. <laughs> and if you have to check your partner's emails, like, whether cheating or not, it doesn't matter. Something is wrong with your relationship. So it's never okay, because guess what? If they're not cheating, you're fucking cheating because you're breaking the trust of the relationship. Um, but, but I do want to say, like, one, uh, one thing, which is I talk to a lot of, again, like, my research, my lab is like the world, and I just talk to a lot of people. And sometimes someone will say, I broke up with my partner because they were so jealous. And I'll start like, I'll probably grill them for like half an hour, like I'm probably grilling you about jealousy after this to find out where it's coming from in you. But, uh, but what I'll do is I'll start, <laughs> there's a story here, I'm getting to the bottom of the <laughs> <laughs> if I get it. <laughs> That's um, funny. So uh, that, but when I start to drill down, they'll be like, oh, they kind of did cheat, like, and the partner never found out, and they were acting shady and suspicious. Or they were just like flirting on, you know, Facebook or something. So oftentimes, sometimes that jealousy is completely warded and merited right. because that person is acting so shady and suspicious. Right. Okay. I mean, I, err, I, I would tell people to err on the side of protecting their relationship. You know, it's, it's such a highly valuable thing to find someone that you really feel you can be with that, um, you know, so I, I do find myself saying things that I'm sure you would completely disagree with. Like, yes. no, I don't, don't, <laughs> don't go on Facebook and find your old flame and start having a conversation. Um, that might be very titillating for you. Oh, that's fun. I enjoy that. Oh, it's harmless. I'm not doing it. You know what? Half of the time, maybe it doesn't go anywhere. The other half of the time, it goes somewhere. I see it. Right. They come in to see me. I'm just saying, you know, if, if, if you play with fire, Sometimes you will get burned. If you want to get burned because you're an emotional masochist, here's then my thought. Here's light my thought. yourself. But in a relationship, if you tell somebody, don't do that. Don't go on Facebook. And again, they're, they're, and they're, maybe there's nothing going on. Here's what's going to happen. That person's going to agree. It's called pathological accommodation. Mm. They will then agree. They will build up resentment. Mm -hmm. That resentment will become more poisonous to the relationship yeah. than innocently testing yeah. you know, that. Ex. Yeah. That can happen. Right. That can happen. Or alternatively. 
you could be talking all the time about what your expectations are in the relationship. For instance, let's say it is monogamy, right? I expect so on, so and so. And you know, if something starts to, you know, if you're saying, so hey, in the name of honesty, I contacted, you know, the guy I went to prom with, and we're having this great, we're talking about this, then bring that into the couple. Then say, oh, if you want to hang out and talk with Joe, let's all hang out and talk. It's when it becomes sequestered that it has the power to totally. devolve into yeah, something Yeah, we're on the same page. It's, it's compartmentalized, it's bad. Like yeah. a general rule yeah. is, can you bring that person in your relationship and have nobody yeah. be awkward? Yep. But cool. you would agree. agree with that, right? Oh, no, I, you, I think... I thought you've sworn off social media. What's that? I thought you've sworn off social media <laughs> yourself. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did for a while, yeah. yeah. Oh, not... <laughs> <laughs> so you're back on? Uh, yeah, back on sometimes. Okay. But the point being... Well, I thought you, you, that you weren't going to be... Uh, Checking Facebook accounts and uh, oh yeah, I have this internet yeah, thing on my computer just yes. as just as a where I only I'm a can only I only go online an hour each day because my computer's blocked otherwise. Just but it keeps but it all of this okay. only works if the person is really able to be honest with themselves. Yep, so and right. just too often that that doesn't happen. And and I'm not saying because they are purposely deceitful with themselves; right. they just don't see it. That's why you know. But here's, here's the thing. I guess I guess like. I agree with you, by the way. Any compartmental, compartmentalization is not healthy. I think it's not healthy for the relationship. Some people say, oh, you should keep a private compartment right. that's your special place, and right. I think Esther Perel and other people will say that. I'm, I, I'll, I'll see what, here's what I can tell you about my relationship, is that um, once I, we were open about everything, we got to have a new kind of relationship versus right. I'm scared of what you're doing, I'm scared of this, but once right. everything was transparent, right. she felt. Because was, intimacy is based on trust. Exactly. And, and, and knowing um, and feeling understood in every respect. Yep. So when that mutual understanding happens and the trust happens too, then it's intimacy on a, whole, on a whole different level. So the problem is not that your partner's on Facebook. The problem is a trust problem that has nothing to do with Facebook. It's a trust problem in general. Yeah, it has nothing to do with Facebook. Mm -hmm. That's a symptom of an underlying problem in the relationship. But you know, if we're going to say that human beings are by nature jealous, and we're going to say human beings are by nature attracted to things and, and like to be sexually titillated, then it's sort of like saying, I'm going to send an, this alcoholic into the bar, and I'm going to say, <laughs> you know, um, I would be saying to the alcoholic, you know what? I would. Mm -hmm. I think it would be better if you didn't drink. I re I, it'll be really hard, but you know, it would be really better if you had a club soda. And you would say, if they want to drink, drink. No, I my, guess. My, my, I would say this. <laughs> I would say that theory sounds to me like I don't think you can control yourself, so I will control you, and it doesn't sound healthy. Mm. I think you know. I think to a degree, it, the. The argument you're, you're having here, it reminds me a lot of moral philosophy. I'm mm. not keen on moral philosophy. I hope I don't interfere. <laughs> interfere. I mean, Aristotle, he's okay. Many people admire him. It's too <laughs> schematic. It's, it's not mm. necessarily based on, on real life. Why, why I think we're locked into, we're, we're talking about relationships. There's a lot of things you could say about why not talk about them. Or why not ignore them to a degree with... But, if you want to get to the nature of jealousy, perhaps you are going to have to take it beyond humans and look at animals and mm. also take it with humans into contexts that are not, um, that, that are not driven by emotional relationships, where St. Paul's not going to raise his head and so on and so forth. Franz de Waal, it's the famous experiment, and some of you will know, with the caption monkeys. Um, one lot, or they're all, they're in separate cages, they can see one another. So you've got a lab attendant, you've got two groups of monkeys, right? One, they're all fed cucumbers. Now, you imagine living on a diet of cucumber week after week. They don't seem to mind it too much for a while. But then what the lab attendant did, there's a TED on this, as you can, you can see, is he, she fed one group of, of capuchins. Um, I'll make it up and say it was strawberries. But at any rate, it was a lot better than a steady diet of lettuce. This happened again. The cucumber capuchins went crazy. When they handed their cucumbers, they threw them out of the cage. They rattled the cage. If they could have got out, they'd have beaten up the lab attendant. <laughs> In other words, that situation had roused up a sort of animal jealousy. It fits exactly with the, the definition we've been saying so far. Now, Duval didn't talk about jealousy. He talked about 
an innate sense of justice uh, in animals. So he argued he saw there. Mm. For me, it seems like there's jealousy operating, perhaps, to encourage equity. So that jealousy, you could have a mm. form of jealousy that is equity jealousy. And those monkeys actually, um, actually show it. So what would that bring to a discussion like this? It just it murks it all up, and we're not going to reach right. conclusions okay. now. But, um, but I think it, we're going to have to start taking questions mm. from the audience now. So if anybody had any questions to, to ask, I think we have some microphones. Do you, do you think we're the only animal who looks to other animals to decide what to do about ourselves? A, a monkey doesn't <laughs> look like a dog and a wolf. They'd be like, look what the wolves are doing. Maybe we should do that. <laughs> Who has a question? Sorry. <clears throat> Go ahead. Any place you're going to the absolutes, whether it's bad or it's necessary, would be just as bad. You can still be aroused without jealousy, right? It wouldn't be necessary. Absolutely, but to speak yes. to your point, I'll speak to your point from experience, which again, <laughs> I have too much of. But so, so I did a book called the, called the Game, where I spent two years with the world's greatest so-called pickup artist who had turned seduction into a science. And there was a part of the seduction known as the jealousy plot line. <laughs> and here's how it worked. And it's the bizarre stuff. I'll just share you like a couple little stories from it. I hear like, I see some nods. People know where this is going. <laughs> but it's like this. You're out, you're out on a date with someone. It's a very lovely date. You're having a very nice time together. I don't know why I'm looking at you, but let's pretend, right? We have some chemistry. <laughs> right? It's, it's already I hot. like slutty bowls. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, 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 we're all, so, and like, it's kind of going nicely. But then all of a sudden, like, maybe I see a friend and I talk to her and she's kind of like being a little touchy feely. And all of a sudden, you're like, wait, I better kind of jump on that. So, when we were out together, and when I did this sort of the game book, like the, the bars and clubs and cafes and malls of the world were like our laboratories. We just experiment with stuff separate from the theory just to see what worked. And I, here's an like, insane example. It makes no sense to me. No sense. But I'll give you an example. This happened multiple times. So you're out with, so, so I'll be out with somebody. Um, and it's kind of going nice. But, and then you kind of go for the kiss. And you kind of get, re and then me would get rejected. Um, and then I'd be like, cool, no problem. And then maybe I'd start talking to someone else. And without hitting on them, maybe they would start showing interest in me. And maybe, like, I remember a couple times I actually made out with this other person. And then I came back to the person I was with. And you're thinking I would never do that. But here's what happened. <laughs> um, they made out with me this time. Now, it makes no, logically no sense. Why would you make out with some asshole who just made out with another person in the bar? Right. I don't know. She Yet just raised your value. Right. She yeah. just raised my right. value. Right. Yeah. So, so you use jealousy to your advantage there. Right. Yeah. So yeah. speaking to this point, it's a, it can be a powerful accelerant to seduction. If I don't jump on this, I'm going to lose it. Well, I would also say that a lot of the recent research that has looked at um, female desire, sexual desire, um, is that arousal and orgasm is very tied specifically to her feeling desired, like as the number one um, sort of fantasy that's going on, what's being imagined, um, and, and sort of the number one feature of of experiencing arousal and orgasm, so um, so it can be obviously, you know, being jealous and expressing your desire and so on, and that she be yours and yours only, et cetera, um, could certainly heighten um, a sexual experience and definitely be part of seduction, no question about it. Um, and of course, for men, it is also very arousing to be desired. So. You know, the issue is obviously um, that's true in theory, and then the question is where do you draw the line? You know, like where, where does it tip? You know, that's the problem is you have to have, I think, ex fantastic communication and know yourself incredibly well to not cross over from, wow, it brought me here, and now we just flipped over to where, you know, I, I kind of think I want to strangle you instead of have sex with you. <laughs> so that, that is the, you know. Unless you're a masochist. Right. right, and then it's all sadist in that case. Yeah. <laughs> um, but because also because jealousy isn't just about desire, and and you know uh, it, it's also there's a hurt in jealousy, right? It's it's some piece of it is about being potentially rejected or rejected in theory and thought, like you chose her over you chose him over me, or you know. So there's a hurt in it, and for some people that is instantly deflating. Deflating. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, 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 I, I can't say this is a uniform thing, but for, for some people, yes. Okay. Do we have another question?
it's, it's a funny thing that the, the, the evidence is mixed until you get to the later period, that what you're dealing with is almost a play jealousy in, in some of the poetry that it'll appear in, uh, when it's heterosexual or when it's, or, or when it's not heterosexual, because you, you're dealing with, with unequals, you're probably dealing with freeborn people and, and slaves, so that the women in, in a poet like, like not Catullus, but, but Propertius, and, and they're not very well-known names outside our area, but, but it's pro the, you're dealing with a woman there who, who's a demi-mondaine, uh, a courtesan, a freed woman or even a slave, so they're playing at jealousy when he talks about it. So it's, it's very hard to know how much truth is there in it, because at the, at the end of it all, he's going to walk away and his parents will tell him, you're going to marry... Chris Beaner or somebody like that who's a freeborn person. So that's what, what complicates the, um, the issue so much there, I think. I would say um, people may feel different intensities of this feeling based on, you know, some nature, some nurture, the, the interaction of the two. Whether someone acts that out or not has to do with many things. Everything from another nature-nurture developed thing called impulsivity. So, you know, are you considering how you, you know, are, are you aware of how you feel? Um, are you able to control things and think them through before you act on them? So there are many neural mechanisms that we're talking about and experiential affecting neural mechanisms that we're talking about that, that affect, you know, how impulsive a person you are, how inhibited a person you are, um, how uh, suspicious or paranoid a person you are, and there, is that driving the jealousy even further? Um, you know, I mean, there are so many things that affect a feeling state going to a behavior. I guess that's, you know, many different, many different things, you know. Was that allowed for you growing up? Were you, you know, a person who was allowed to just act on what they felt? Or were you, are you a fairly repressed person? You were told that's, that's never OK. Um, and then you know, your personal insight into what's, what's going on and whether that would be a good thing for you to act out or not. I, I think you know, there's so many, um, there are, are many things that can um, affect what stays a thought versus and an emotion um, versus goes on to be a behavior, and including the, the current environment around you. So, you know, um, you may be more likely to act if the person that you're accusing gets back in your face or laughs or does something that, you know, in the moment ignites your feeling further or shames you, adds another feeling to it. Um, Shame is, is one of the most, uh, I think, driving, there's your next book now, but <laughs> and the most driving of emotions. You know, mo more suicides are committed over shame mm -hmm. um, probably than, than anything else, actually. Um, so it, I think, you know, all of these things come to bear on whether you behave or not. I guess that's what I would say. Here's a, by the way, so, so, what, so what happened was it was actually, um, it was a previous relationship, and, uh, and it was her that suggested we were in a relationship where, to be graphic or whatever, who cares, no one will ever see this, right? It's not being videotaped or anything, right? No. So uh, we were in a relationship where kind of other women were involved, and then it felt restrictive, and so she kind of said, let's open this up, and I thought, that's true, that's what I believe, we shouldn't control others, and so that kind of came from her. What I've tended to find in, open, in a lot of the open relationships, generally, is I found that generally, uh, I found that if you want to open it because you just desire to sleep with other people, it tends not to work. If you want to open it because you, it's going to be beneficial to, there's three entities in a relationship. There's you, your partner, and the relationship. So if it's beneficial to all three entities, that kind of works. It's not going to work if it's just sort of a, you know, a way to get out and a selfish way to do what you want. But here's kind of how our relationship is now. Like I think we have a lot of, feels like we have a lot of like false concepts that are the litter all over the world of sexuality and relationships. Even the idea of men are like this, women are like that. I don't, I think most of the differences are cultural, you know, and I don't, I think we also look for um, confirm, confirmation bias. Oh, that one person did that, that's my idea, is right. Mm. Everyone's just talking from experience and we see what we want to see out of our little box. You know, I really think if we chose, here's a little example. Right before we were having sort of what you called an argument, right? 
And then later I said, oh, we should go on a date afterward because it's like conflict and it's exciting. So by me saying one sentence, what was sort of awkward became romantic. Still the same feelings, it's just a sentence where we're changing the frame through which we see it. So, um, so the point being about, so our relation, my marriage now, we kind of made the decision like monogamy or non-monogamy, what, who fucking cares? Let's just love each other, right? And, every, and also all these ideas like, um, I know the next panel, the next discussion you guys are having is about keeping relationships hot. What's not hot is, I don't trust you, so you can't get on Facebook. Then who want, that becomes mom, and who wants to have sex with their mom? Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, it's not going to make it hot by becoming someone's mom or turning someone else into your mom. Someone also is shady on Facebook, so they turn their relationship into a, into a sort of a parallel of their childhood relationship. So anyway. But when you have a child, uh -huh. right. that and also changes the dynamic. So you know, it's, it's um, because of what we're talking about that, you know, originally of whose attention do you want, and you want it, and so on. When you see, if you see parents being with other people, and um, you know that that really that's not that easy for a child. I'll, I'll just they, say they that did long-term studies on polyamorous families. Yes, and they actually found over 15 years longitudinal studies. By the way, I don't believe in studies. But I know you really do. Yeah, yeah, I don't really, really doubt really this one. Point. But I no, don't really doubt this one. But and also there's a book. There's a there's a book called Sex and Dumb. It's easy to doubt it, but truth is it doesn't matter. We yeah. don't know. Here's the deal. Yeah. A child just needs the love of parents, yes. period. Yes. So more loving caregivers is great. More dysfunctional caregivers is bad. It doesn't matter what the number is. Well, sex partners doesn't mean more caregivers. That's, and sex doesn't mean complete. no love. Right. So, That's true. So anyway. And, and I would just say, in, in, in your, to your point of, of men and women, you know, it's all a cultural construct. That, that's not entirely, that, that can't be entirely true. We do know men and women. I mean, if you, if you look at uh, neurology and what's, what's going on, I mean, men and women absolutely 100% have different brains. However, it's not like here's women's brains and here's men's brains. It's, it's sort of like here's, you know, here's, in other words, the peaks are, are different at the peaks, but really there's tremendous overlap. And, and as we're, you know, increasingly learning, you know, there are people who are transgender. There are people who, you know, Hormonal influence on brain makes there be tremendous variety, and really, there's there are there are men who think more like women and women who think more like men, and you know, so that you can't you can't make this total distinction. And yet, we do know that if you look at the whole population of men and the whole population of women, there are differences. Okay, I think we're going to have to end. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the, all, all the speakers will be doing a book signing if you want to follow up in the tinker room upstairs. Thank you very much. Thank you.